Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's wonderful to welcome you to St John's in Cambridge for this uh, special climate change lecture. And a very warm welcome to those of you who are joining us on the live stream. We've actually got, well, we were due to have two live streams uh, happening this evening. One of them's working, one of them isn't. So um, we are recording this event. So if anyone will have missed it, uh, we hope very much that you'll be able to catch up at the beginning of next week. So as I say, it's a really great joy to have you. And the first of these series of lectures on this very topical issue of climate change. And I'm very grateful to my uh, friend and colleague, Alex Cassidy from Christian Aid, who has helped to organize this evening. This last week, some of you will have heard that um, there was a joint statement a couple of days ago from the Archbishop of Canterbury and from the Pope and from the Ecumenical Patriarch. And I'm just going to quote from that very briefly. Uh, it's a joint declaration. And the statement says, We call on everyone, whatever their belief or worldview, to endeavour to listen to the cry of the earth and of people who are poor, examining their behaviour and pledging meaningful sacrifices for the sake of the earth which God has given us. Well, the title of tonight is COP26, The Inside Story. And we're deeply grateful for uh, Dr Joe De Pledge. Uh, from our local community who has been an expert on international climate change negotiations. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jo, who will deliver her lecture, and there will be space for uh, questions and answers at the end. So please do store up those questions, either on the live stream uh, or um, those who are here in the audience, so that we can engage with Jo. And we look forward very much to all that you're sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, introduction, James, and good evening, everyone. I'm really, really pleased uh, to be here with you. I'm particularly pleased as this is actually my first in-person talk that I've given since COVID moved everything online. So it's quite thrilling to see real people um, and real faces in front of me. Having said that, welcome to everybody, including those uh, listening online. Now, as James said, I've been working on the international climate change negotiations for pretty much all my adult life in various capacities um, as a UN Secretariat staff member, an environmental reporter, a journal editor, an academic, and now as a slightly burnt out uh, independent researcher. And having worked on the UN negotiations for so long, it was really quite exciting for me when it was announced that the UK would be hosting COP26. And what I'd like to do this evening is to, to share and convey some of that excitement with you um, and give you my inside story of COP26. You'll see I've slightly changed the um, title to an inside story because, of course, there are thousands of people's stories. Now, whenever I mention to a new acquaintance that I work on climate change, there are a few questions that always seem to crop up. So I thought I would deal with these right now. The first one, is climate change really happening? Quick answer, yes. Um, the UN body that assesses the science, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has been actually clear about this for 30 years. Its latest report was published just last month, and it confirms um, that global average temperatures that you can see here have already risen by about one degree since the pre-industrial period. And that is leading to uh, more frequent and more intense weather extremes. Second question that I get, is climate change caused by humans? Again, yes. I mean, the climate does vary naturally due to a whole range of natural factors, which you'll have learned about in school. But human activity associated with our modern way of life, in particular the burning of fossil fuels, coal, petrol, and also the clearance of forests and natural vegetation, this is releasing greenhouse gases in ever greater quantities. And these greenhouse gases, mostly carbon dioxide, also methane and others, these have a warming effect when they collect in the atmosphere. And as you can see from this chart, this warming effect is overriding the natural variation. This is what we'd expect with natural variations only, and this is what we're getting with human and natural together. 
Is climate change a serious problem? Well, again, yes. Uh, rising temperatures are already destabilising the weather and triggering sea level rise. So just over the past few months, we've experienced the heat domes over the Western United States, floods in Germany, and wildfires in Greece, to name but a few. And these are the kinds of extreme events that will become more common. Now, to avoid the worst impacts, governments have established the goal of limiting warming to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels, and preferably 1.5. Now, remember, we've already raised temperatures by one degree. And these limits were established because the impacts of climate change are known to get much worse, or thought to get much worse, beyond these limits. But to avoid going over these limits, our greenhouse gas emissions would need to fall dramatically. In fact, what we call net zero in the coming decades. And more on that in a minute. The all-important question, what are we doing about this? So essentially, to bring our greenhouse gas emissions down to net zero, changes are needed everywhere, in every economic sector, every walk of life. But if that just seems a bit too complicated uh, to compute, then focus on the core challenge, which is to halt and reverse deforestation and to stop consuming fossil fuels, starting with coal, also oil and gas, and stop consuming them almost completely. Renewable energies, such as wind and solar, illustrated here, will need to fill this gap, along with other green tech and uh, reductions in energy demand. Now, in case you're wondering, this is a photo from Sheringham Shoal, an offshore wind farm uh, close to us off the coast of Norfolk. Uh, this is the world's largest concentrated solar power plant in, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but it's in Morocco. Huge, huge thing. Now, we have known about the dangers of climate change for pretty much 30 years. How much progress have we made in those three decades? Uh, not nearly enough. However, we have made some progress, and I really don't want to convey an impression of doom and gloom to you, uh, because that would actually be incorrect. So, sorry, another chart, but in concrete terms, what we see here is that the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions of many of the most developed countries, so the United States, the EU, among that Germany, also the UK, these emissions are actually on a slow downward trend since about uh, 1990 or, or, or 2000, despite rising income levels. That's important. So overall, what we see, and this is even more important, is that poorer countries are generally developing along a less carbon intensive path than we did a hundred years ago. So it's possible now, already with the new technology, the new efficiencies that we have, to raise living standards without a corresponding rise in emissions. And that is what this graph shows. GDP per capita, so basically wealth per person, has gone steadily upwards, a dip in the 2008 economic crisis. Um, CO2 emissions per person are not going up by the same rate at all, and in fact have pretty much stabilised um, over the past uh, 10 years or so. This is called decoupling, and it's very important. Uh, market trends are also increasingly favouring renewables. Um, what we see here is that the cost, this illustrates the cost of generating electricity. We can see how much the cost of generating electricity from solar power has absolutely plummeted by about 80% over the past 10 years, and of offshore wind too, and indeed onshore wind. Now this is globally, it will be different to different parts of the world, but that big price decline is, is, is very important indeed, and indeed very hopeful. However, there's still a long way to go. I wouldn't be here if that wasn't the case. This is the current global emissions pathway. You can see it is rising relentlessly, albeit at a somewhat slower rate over the past uh, few years. And this is what we need to achieve. We're about here now, and our emissions need to absolutely plummet to net zero. So the blue line 
is what we need to do if we're aiming for a two degree temperature rise, and the red line is what we're aiming for, for 1.5. I mean, either implies an absolutely dramatic transformation that would be unprecedented in, in peacetime. And this is where the COP comes in. So COP26 is the latest staging post in a process launched by the UN three decades ago to respond to these scientific warnings and confront the climate change challenge. So every year, the world's governments meet in this forum known as the COP uh, to discuss, to review, to coordinate, and hopefully strengthen their actions on climate change. They debate points on that year's agenda and hopefully agree decisions on a range of issues. So it's very much like a PCC meeting, right? Or a, or a city council meeting just at a considerably larger scale. Now, there's lots of jargon in the UN and climate change. I've already mentioned quite a few words that might seem difficult to understand. So let's demystify some of that. Uh, so COP26 is the 26th annual COP. COP stands for the Conference of the Parties. And the parties means the countries that have signed up to the UN Climate Change Treaties. So principally, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, or the UNFCCC, adopted in 1992. Also, the Kyoto Protocol, and most recently, the Paris Agreement. Now, 196 countries plus the European Union, it has its own status, are parties they've signed up to the UNFCCC, so they can participate in the COP. Now, under the climate change treaties, all countries are committed to avoiding dangerous climate change, that is, to limit warming to well below 2 degrees, preferably 1.5. To do this, they must regularly table pledges to curb their emissions, and these are known as NDCs, or Nationally Determined Contributions. You won't be able to get through the next few months without hearing the word NDC um, somewhere. Um, they must report on what they're doing, which is actually really, really important. And the richest countries are obliged to support the developing world, the poorer nations, uh, with finance and technology transfer, both to help them cut their own emissions and to adapt to the inevitable climate changes. And this um, equity principle, whereby the richest countries must take the lead and help the developing world, is very firmly ingrained in the UN response. Uh, it's very political, it's very debated, but it's very much um, enshrined there. So, COPs take place annually. Last year was an exception uh, because of COVID, and they take place in cities around the world. Uh, the first, first COP took place in Berlin in uh, 1995. Happened to be chaired by one Angela Merkel, who you may have heard of, then Environment Minister for Germany. And now countries bid to host a COP. It's a bit like the Olympics or the, um, the Football World Cup, with different world regions eligible on a rotational basis. So this year, it was the turn of the uh, so-called Western European and Others group. And then the host country, whoever wins the bid, takes on the COP presidency, that is the chairing role, and that is us, the UK. Now, technically speaking, the presidency is held jointly with, by the UK in partnership with Italy. That's because Italy also bid to host the COP, but there can only be one host. Um, and because it's taking place in Glasgow, the UK really does have the lion's share of responsibility, but Italy will be hosting a series of pre-COP meetings, for example, a youth summit uh, in the run-up to uh, Glasgow. Now, delegations, countries rather, governments send delegations of varying sizes to each COP. Um, richer countries and those who are very much engaged uh, in climate change, who attach great importance to the issues, they will come out in force. Some delegations can be 100 people, um, uh, can have up to 100 people, if not more, although the average is probably something like between 10, 10 and 50 um, government officials. Now, the number of government delegates at COPS has risen over the years. Uh, the record was 17,000 at COP21 in Paris in 2015. 
I mean, it's difficult to tell, but Glasgow is unlikely to command these kinds of numbers, partly because, to be fair, it's slightly less important than the Paris COP was, and of course, uh, because of COVID. But I think we're still talking about expected participation of government delegations, maybe in the five, six, uh, seven thousand. So in formal sessions, senior delegates sit behind their country nameplates, as you can see here. And if they want to speak, they raise their nameplate, as you can see um, Japan doing here. And everything is interpreted into the six UN languages, uh, Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. So sadly, this chap from Japan um, is in a slightly difficult situation. Now, the COP president or chairperson uh, presides. So here we have, um, it was the Peruvian environment minister at COP20 in Lima. Uh, for us, it will be our former minister of business and energy, uh, Alok Sharma. He's our COP president. He will be sitting at this seat. He may delegate from time to time, but he's the one you'll see uh, up on the podium there. Uh, I should say, though, that most of the real negotiations take place in more informal settings, in spin-off groups, smaller rooms, coffee bars, corridors, that, that kind of thing. Now, all countries have an equal say in principle. That's enshrined in the convention. One country, one vote. But obviously, in practice, the more powerful will tend to hold greater sway. And for that reason, small developing countries, they tend to group together in coalitions. So you might hear over the um, two weeks of COP26 of such coalitions as AOSIS, the Alliance of Small Island States. You might hear of the CVF, the Climate Vulnerable Forum, a group of the most vulnerable countries. Or even the G77. The G77 is the group of all developing countries negotiating together. There's about 130 of them. There we are. Now, it can be a very messy process trying to reach agreement among 196 countries, plus the EU, who speak different languages, hail from different political cultures, and often feel they have very different interests. And it's made all the more challenging by the absence of any agreed decision-making rules, for example, any agreed voting majority. Now, this is because countries haven't been able to agree on what the voting majority should be. So the default is that all decisions must be taken by consensus. So that is broadly agreed by all countries, or at least not openly objected to by anyone. So in fact, here you can see Nicaragua is openly and vociferously objecting to a decision which then could not be adopted by consensus. Uh, you can see him there. So it's the job of the president, so Alok Sharma, to interpret the general sense of the room and determine whether or not there actually is consensus to adopt a decision. This can be a very delicate matter, as you can imagine. And at that point, if the president deems there is consensus, he or she will bang the hammer, also known as the gavel, and announce it is so decided. So that's really the kind of culminating point of COP26 will be when Alok Sharma, when, if um, he does that. Now, you might think that at a climate change conference, the main aim of all countries is to find the best way of tackling climate change. You might think that, but you would be wrong. Despite negotiating for almost 30 years, countries still disagree on the pace of action, who should take responsibility, and pretty much everything else besides. Broader geopolitics, economic concerns, and narrowly defined perceptions of national interest tend to predominate. So climate politics are really very complex, but at the risk of simplification, there are five main country-level factors that tend to influence a country's approach to climate change. Level of development, that's probably the main one. Vulnerability to climate change impacts. Share of global greenhouse gas emissions. Emissions per person or per capita, as we tend to say. And then economic dependence on fossil fuels. Now, of course, these factors are slightly overlapping and interdependent, but they're the five main ones uh, to keep an eye out on. So, for example, oil exporting developing countries, such as Saudi Arabia, who are heavily dependent on export oil revenues 
and have high emissions per person, are very resistant to strong action. They have consistently obstructed the negotiations and objected to perfectly sensible technical decisions because they fear the economic impacts of a low carbon world. It's not just me saying that, it's um, a well-known fact in the negotiations. Now, the poorer developing countries from, say, Africa or the small islands are very vulnerable to weather extremes and sea level rise, yet their emissions are still tiny. We can see this here with the paler areas. Their emissions are still tiny, both in terms of their annual share of total emissions and in terms of their emissions per person. So these countries tend to be the negotiations to kind of push the richer nations um, to take more responsibility and to argue for greater financial support for themselves. And, and you can see why they would do that. Large emerging economies, such as China uh, or India, now these have risen to be among some of the highest total emitters now. You can see this uh, by the darkly coloured shaded um, country area here. However, um, their per capita emissions, emissions per person, are still quite a lot lower than they are in the richer world. So they argue that they shouldn't take on uh, particularly stringent commitments yet because their emissions per person are still quite low. And this is especially the case with India, whose emissions per person are still absolutely tiny, despite it being the third largest total emitter in terms of global share. Basically, the main message to take away from this is that most countries seem to find a way of arguing that they should do less than everybody else. So, in addition to the governmental negotiations, COPs are also a forum for interested civil society groups um, to meet, to showcase their own initiatives, to observe the negotiations, and to lobby government delegates. And this lively, colourful jamboree often contrasts quite starkly to the former procedures of the um, UN intergovernmental negotiations. And the range of groups has increased and diversified a lot over the years, uh, covering environmental groups, of course, businesses, local governments, trade unions, youth organisations, indigenous peoples, and of course, uh, faith groups and churches. Um, I looked this up and apparently about 3% generally of um, non-governmental representatives come from faith groups generally at COPs, that is rising, and about 80% of those are from Christian churches. Overall, there are thousands of such NGO delegates represented, and the, the record was 13,000 um, at COP15 in Copenhagen in 2009. Now, that conference got a little bit out of hand. Uh, that's a picture of the NGO zone here, and since then, um, some limits have been placed on observer groups, but we can still expect thousands to be there in Glasgow. Um, now, these NGOs usually do most of their activities in a public zone. So if anybody wants to go to Glasgow, aims to go to Glasgow, this is where you would most be able to participate. And to be honest, it's by far the most interesting part of the COP, most interesting and innovative. Now, over the years, some COPs have been really pivotal events, landmark events, adopting a new treaty or a landmark set of decisions. Others have been much more routine, focused on more technical questions. Now, COP26 in Glasgow is not actually scheduled to do anything very exciting. It's not scheduled to adopt any new treaties, any decisions. So in that sense, it is more routine, but its importance lies in its timing, its crucial timing. Uh, why is this? So under the terms of the Paris Agreement, COP26 is the deadline for countries to send in updated, hopefully more ambitious, emission pledges. Yeah, the NDCs that I spoke about. So at the moment, the NDCs that countries have sent in, saying um, what emission targets they aim to reach, at the moment, these don't add up to anything like the cuts needed to uh, keep global warming below two degrees, let alone 1.5. Now, the Paris Agreement says the government should update their plans every five years, and this should have been last year, but because of COVID, the deadline was pushed back to now. 
And the great hope and expectation is that countries will submit stronger, updated pledges that would bring the world closer to the two degree limits. So far, just over two thirds of the 190 or so countries have sent in their pledges, but there are still big gaps. We've not heard from China, we've not heard from India, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, we're still waiting on those. Um, and this wait is on to see if they will submit updated, stronger pledges by Glasgow. And I must say, all these countries are under a lot of diplomatic, diplomatic pressure to do so. And then time is genuinely running out. I don't really subscribe to this notion that COP26 is the last chance to save the world. I, I just don't think that's true and it's just not really very helpful. But it's true that urgent action is needed and really should have started decades ago. I mean, as you saw in that previous graph, if emissions don't peak and decline in the next decade or so, then atmospheric physics simply dictate that we can't avoid going over the 1.5 warming limit. It simply will be impossible. Um, and in fact, Alok Sharma has made keeping 1.5 in reach as one of his main aims for the summit. Now, obviously, COP26 is unusual because it comes in the context of COVID. So the, for the first time ever, there was no COP last year. And the one the year before, the last one to be held in 2019 was in Madrid. And this was not a success. There was intense squabbling. It proved difficult to really agree anything, even uh, routine decisions. And the hope is that the enforced pause in the climate negotiations caused by COVID will provide the opportunity for a, a more positive reset. But at the same time, organizing a COP in the midst of a global pandemic is challenging uh, to say the least. Now the UK has insisted all along and continues to do so that the COP will take place in person. And in fact, it set up a vaccination scheme um, targeting any COP delegate that can't get a vaccination um, at home. But there are all kinds of issues that could arise, as I'm sure you can imagine. Some delegates will have to quarantine on arrival. There's always the danger there might be an outbreak during the conference. If this were to involve a high profile delegation, like someone from India or China or Saudi Arabia, then the political repercussions could be, could be quite significant. But on a more positive note, hopes are higher for COP26 uh, than they have been for a long time, because we now have a supportive US president in power. Now, I'm afraid the US has been um, a highly disruptive presence in the climate change negotiations over the past decades. It has basically flip-flopped flip -flopped from supportive to obstructive, pretty much with each change in presidential administration. So most recently, President Obama, um, President Obama participated very actively in the negotiation of the Paris Agreement only for Donald Trump to withdraw the US uh, from the agreement when he took office. And this was actually a rerun of what happened 15 years before, um, when President Bill Clinton, working with his Vice President Al Gore, actively negotiated the Kyoto Protocol, which the next president, President George Bush uh, Jr., uh, declined to join. So the US has never become a party to the Kyoto Protocol. However, President Biden did um, rejoin the Paris Agreement. That was one of the first things he did uh, on taking office um, in January. So, you know, as the world's second highest emitter and obviously a world economic and technological superpower still, it's really important to have the US on board. And I mean, the damage done by the Bush administration and the Trump administration in withdrawing from the international climate change agenda was absolutely huge. Um, also because they did virtually nothing domestically, whereas developed countries are supposed to lead um, with their domestic action. Anyway, now that the US has rejoined the Paris Agreement and is trying to adopt domestic climate change laws, there is hope that it can bring renewed leadership to the negotiations. So obviously for us, COP26 is a special COP because it's the first time it's taking place on UK soil. And I've heard the Queen is planning to attend, which I think pays testimony 
to the importance um, attached to this event as a nation. And as host of the Glasgow Conference, the UK has a really central role to play, both in terms of ensuring the logistics are right, and I've already said that's going to be much more tricky in the time of COVID, and in terms of the politics. So as COP president, it's up to Alok Sharma uh, and his team, working with the UN uh, Secretariat to manage the negotiations to achieve the most successful outcome. The COP president has a difficult job. He has to remain neutral and objective. He has to gain the trust of all the delegations. But at the same time, he has to be tough, right? He has to broker some compromises. He has to knock heads together to try and reach that um, all, well, hopefully not elusive, um, agreement. Now, the particular chairing style and political strategy of a COP president and decisions they take, often under great pressure, can make or break a COP. So COP15 in, oh, wrong one, sorry. COP15 in Copenhagen, um, for example, in 2009, now that COP descended into complete disarray, uh, partly because the Danish COP president, uh, Mr. Rasmussen here, he just didn't understand UN procedures and he managed to lose the trust of delegates. That was really a very traumatic moment in the climate change process. Uh, COP6 in 2000 also broke down uh, for slightly different reasons, partly because of unwise moves again by the Dutch president. And in fact, I was going through my archives the other day and I found this um, newspaper article which from 2000, which you may or may not be able to see, it basically says, climate talks end in disaster. And that was in November 2000. The sharp-eyed of you of a certain age may notice John Prescott here. Uh, he was heavily involved in those negotiations and he stormed out um, saying, I'm gutted. That was quite a, a famous moment in the climate negotiations. Um, but at other times, skillful COP presidents have really jumped in and saved the day. Uh, this is Angela Merkel at COP1, where she did a particularly good job. Here we have Patricia Espinosa, the Mexican COP president, who managed to basically rescue the climate change process after the debacle in Copenhagen. And here we have Laurent Fabius from France, triumphantly uh, waving his gavel after adopting the Paris Agreement. So it's really impossible to overstate the importance of a good presidency to reaching agreement and also, unfortunately, the opposite. Now, how is the UK likely to perform? This is the all important question. I think it's true to say that Alok, Alok Sharma has a good reputation as a solid pair of hands. He's clearly committed. He is putting in the groundwork. He's visited many countries and ministers around the world over the past year. And that kind of preparatory work, he's been criticised for it, but it's actually really, really important to listen to different points of view and to build relationships. He's got a great team in place. I can personally vouch for the chief negotiator, um, Archie Young. He's experienced, deeply knowledgeable, has good uh, relationships with his counterparts. I've also highlighted here uh, Nigel Topping, uh, who has the brief of climate champion working with NGOs, businesses and other stakeholders. Now, given the importance and the high political profile of the conference, heads of states will be invited. Um, presidents and prime ministers have been issued with this all-important invitation. And in fact, if everybody shows up, which is somewhat uncertain because of COVID, I think it will represent the largest gathering of world leaders in the UK since the Second World War. So the great man himself, Boris Johnson, uh, will be expected to intervene, to participate actively, to cajole, to persuade other heads of state, at least to work the phone lines to reach agreement. Now, as president, the UK needs credibility and it needs authority. And here I would say that our situation is somewhat ambivalent. So the UK has clocked up some really important successes in cutting its emissions. You'll remember that downward trend that I showed you in the graph. We have considerably decarbonised our electricity system, uh, due largely to a shift from coal to gas and then to renewables. Our Climate Change Act and legislation agreed in 2008 is genuinely 
a world leader. If Boris Johnson says that, then he is actually right. And the UK has enshrined a, in law a target to slash emissions to net zero by 2050. This is all ambitious stuff. It's great. But in other ways, our leadership position is somewhat flawed. Um, although the UK is great on target setting, it's lagging behind a bit on policy. Um, we are not on track to meet our forthcoming interim climate targets, while the current government has not done very much at all on emissions from transport or homes. And in fact, I think it's a great quote by the CEO of the UK Climate Change Committee, targets are not going to be achieved by magic, something I think we'd all agree with. Uh, the UK is still considering proposals to potentially open a new coal mine in Cumbria, which really doesn't help to persuade other poorer countries to phase out their coal. And the cutting of overseas aid, although climate uh, finance is ring-fenced, but the cutting of the overseas aid has done great damage to our reputation abroad. And it means that calls for greater financial assistance to developing countries are basically being met with scepticism. Well, if you can't do it, then, then why should we? Now, this is... Yeah, I mean, at the geopolitical level, UK relations with China, an absolute key player, are pretty much at rock bottom. Now, this hasn't really got much to do with climate at all. It's more to do with Hong Kong, with Huawei, uh, with the Uyghurs, but it certainly makes uh, the negotiations a lot more difficult. Uh, we have heard on the grapevines that UK negotiators are finding it difficult to even contact and speak to their counterparts in China, when in the past a phone call was all it took, now it's getting a lot more difficult uh, to make those contacts. And apparently the vaccine rollout, supposedly for COP delegates from the developing countries, is running into trouble. In fact, just today there was news from the, that the environmental NGOs, the biggest group of environmental NGOs, is actually calling for COP26 to be postponed because they don't think that the developing countries can attend in the numbers needed because the vaccines that the UK government has promised are being delayed. Now, it is obviously a very, very difficult situation. You know, no one envies the, the UK presidency and having to, to, you know, to work all this politics in the midst of a COVID pandemic. What we really need is goodwill. For the moment, I think the UK government has it, but we'll have to see if it holds out. Now, how is COP26 likely to unfold, assuming it happens? What should you watch out for? Above all, high drama. Now, don't be alarmed if the whole process seems to be collapsing around the middle of the second week. This is perfectly normal. It's probably a good sign. Uh, there will be many tense days. There will be many late night sessions. Tempers will, will be running high. There'll be emotional scenes. There might be tears, walkouts, protests. Uh, here, for example, you have one of my former bosses, uh, a, one of the UN climate chiefs who literally, Michael will remember this moment, who literally burst into tears on the podium in 2007 in Bali just under the sheer stress and pressure of it all. You know, these things do happen. Uh, the negotiations will no doubt uh, go down to the wire. They'll um, overrun their scheduled deadline by at least uh, 24 hours and this is the norm. And it's the norm because the stakes are very high economically, environmentally, even existentially and delegates want to be sure they've got the best possible deal. Now, if you're wondering what this is, this is the, COP, the Polish COP president of COP24 in 2018, who was so happy um, that his COP had managed, with, managed to end with a number of successful decisions that he started to dance um, on the table. So that isn't a requirement for Alok Sharma, but clearly some kind of high dramatics are to be expected. Now, I'm almost certain that COP26 will actually be declared a success. I think there's too much riding on it for it to be seen as a failure. Uh, but at the same time, environmental groups will also inevitably say it's a failure and not enough. So how can we, St John's, make sense of these claims? In my view, to actually be a proper success, COP26 needs to achieve five key outcomes. Firstly, we need to see much stronger pledges, stronger NDCs. As I said, watch out for announcements from China, India, South Africa, also Russia. These should hopefully add up to something close to two degrees. I don't think 1.5 is possible, but close to, do, close to two would be very, very good. 
as well as emission pledges, the world's richest nations need to commit to a significant uplift in financial support for the developing world, finance for both curbing emissions and adapting to climate change impacts. Now, thirdly, COP26 does need to take some outstanding decisions that have been very much delayed on the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Now, this is technical stuff, um, it's jargon, but it is actually at the heart of the COP. Um, and these decisions mostly concern establishing a market for trading uh, emissions credits, along with finalising reporting guidelines. So what you may hear are references to the Paris Agreement rulebook or to Article 6. That's because it's the article in the Paris Agreement on emissions trading. Now, this rule book should have been completed uh, three years ago uh, in Poland, at the COP in Poland, but governments couldn't agree on the details. Uh, as I say, it's all rather technical. It doesn't really matter in the greater scheme of things, but for the credibility of the UN process, this rule book must be completed. So now that you're experts on COP26, you'll be able to talk about Article 6 and the Paris Agreement rule book. Really much more important than it sounds. Now, as I said earlier, as I implied earlier, it's difficult to take strong decisions in the UN process itself because of the need to have the consensus of all countries and because of the politics involved. And for this reason, the UK is working quite hard to try to form so-called climate clubs of interested governments that want, to, that want to go further, that want to take the lead in specific areas also working with businesses, with industrial groups and investors. And particular sectors that are being targeted are electric cars, forests, also coal and an end to oil exploration. So for example, Costa Rica and Denmark, they want to start a climate club of countries who would pledge to end all oil exploration in their territories. And these kinds of climate clubs, they're a kind of parallel process to the all-inclusive global UN process, but they really could be quite important to actually achieving concrete action on the ground. And finally, I would like to see a strong Glasgow declaration, a political declaration signed by all governments to send a really strong political signal to the markets, to economic and financial actors, that the world is indeed deadly serious about decarbonising. So what does this mean for all of us? So decisions taken at COP26, hopefully, will challenge us to make real changes to our lifestyles. But to be honest, we really don't need to wait uh, for COP26. The message has been loud and clear for decades now. It's simply impossible to radically cut greenhouse gas emissions to the levels needed to avoid dangerous climate change while maintaining business as usual. Behavioural changes will be inevitable. I mean, the main, I'm not going to lecture you, yeah? The main changes that people need to make are reasonably well known, and I've illustrated some here. Um, you know, leave the car at home, use your bike, um, adopt a plant-based diet as much as possible, turn your appliances off, take the train. All these things um, I'm sure that you know already. But to these, I would also add starting to think about adapting to inevitable climate changes. And this is actually the first time I've ever mentioned this in a lecture, but I think it's becoming important. Make sure your houses are well insulated from heat waves. Invest in blinds for south-facing windows. If you've got a garden, think about planting trees for shade and to help avoid surface flooding. These things are actually going to become really important. But unfortunately, what we can actually do as individuals is constrained by the broader infrastructure and system in which we operate. So too often, as someone who tries to do the right thing, I'm sure you all do too, the low carbon option does remain often the most expensive and the least convenient. I'm always struck about the fact that it would be cheaper for me to park my car in Lion Yard car park for two hours than it would be to get the bus into town uh, with my family. But for this to change, we need government policy to change, and governments can be reluctant to take really strong measures for fear of losing voter support. And so perhaps I think the most important thing you can do is to make it clear to your MP 
that you support strong climate action, if indeed you do. And in particular, that you would be willing to incur greater regulation, higher prices for some polluting goods and services, and potentially some restrictions on the luxuries and freedoms that many of us take for granted, because these kinds of measures will be needed. Now, if that sounds a bit harsh, I will end with two pieces of good news. One is that I think the COVID pandemic, really tragic in so many ways, but it has underlined that we are an adaptable species and in extremis, if needs be, we can change our lifestyles in ways that were previously absolutely unthinkable. And we may actually like some of the changes. And the second is that in my view, much of what is, ne of what is needed to create a lower carbon world will actually lead to a healthier, safer, more equitable, possibly cheaper, and probably happier world in the long run. Now, to conclude, I will just leave you with one of my favourite cartoons, which was forwarded to me by a South African colleague. Of course, everybody wants change, but who wants to change? There, I'll leave it. Joe, you've given us so much. Um, we'll do a vote of thanks in, in a few minutes, but let's move straight into questions because we have limited time. I think we're, the, the slot is an hour or just over. So uh, rather than saying thank you now, we're going to move into questions. Do we have any questions that we're aware of that have come through the live stream or through messages? Um, let's move to the floor. Um, I've got lots of questions, but I don't want to hog the floor. So. Um, do you want to raise a hand if you would like to ask Joe a question? I'll come over with a microphone. Now, you have given us a wonderful overview, yeah? I have been very interested in the subject, but I haven't done much reading. So I got a tremendous amount of additional information. I always ask myself, what can I, as an individual, as a member of a larger family, as an example of the younger generation, do to convince them that the contribution of the individual is essential. When we discuss this subject, everybody says, but it's up to the big corporations. It's up to the government. It's up to the inventors. It's up to the in investors. It has nothing got to do with us or very little. So there must be something which you can send out to the individual, to the younger generations, that they change their mind and that they start doing something which truly contributes. Thank you very much. So it's about responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, let, let's, do you want to answer that or shall I take another question? Um, well, on the one hand, it's a very difficult question to answer, but it's also a very easy one. I think that the climate crisis has reached a stage when everyone has to do something there is nobody that is exempt from the need to take all the action that anyone possibly can do. I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of the saying, I don't know who said it, that uh, no one made a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could only do a little. And I think that's a very powerful statement on a whole range of different issues, but uh, certainly climate change. I, I know that on the Cumbrian coal mine, for example, the government is thinking of approving this coal mine, and one of the reasons they are giving is that it would only contribute 1% of the UK's climate emissions. But the point is that all the percentages add up, right? Everybody's own contribution adds up. Um, so to my mind, we have got to that stage when it is up to every single individual to do whatever they can in whatever sphere they can. Look to your, you know, what is your community? If you're, if you're a young person, look to your school, look to your college, look to your university. Thank you very much, John. That's really interesting. And, and often young people do t are taking the leadership. Um, yes, Bill. Um, but when we started this process, everyone was saying that 1.5 degree increase um, was pretty disastrous. We now seem to be moving to accepting that 2% uh, is, um, is the sort of minimum we can possibly expect to achieve. And I just wonder, can we go beyond that? Or is, 
What will happen if we exceed 2%? Is this a total disaster? No, that's very interesting. Actually, technically, it's the opposite. So technically, the Paris Agreement said that the main goal was to, was to limit temperature rise to 2 degrees, to well below 2 degrees, and that we would try for 1.5 if possible. So actually, that collective goal is 2 degrees rather than 1.5. There has been a kind of pivot towards 1.5 on the part of environmental organisations and on the part of social justice organisations uh, because of the greater impact on poorer communities, for example. So the pivot has actually been to 1.5 and away from 2. Personally, I think the 1.5 is simply not possible. I think that if we're at 1 at the moment, it is not possible to level out at 1.5. Um, none of the models say that are projecting what might happen say that we can achieve 1.5 without very significant drawdown. I haven't talked about that, but drawdown, taking out carbon from the atmosphere through extensive tree planting, through very high-tech uh, strategies that we don't really have yet. And the other thing we need to bear in mind is there are still large parts of the world that are extremely poor, that don't yet have any infrastructure, and they need to develop. And I think it's simply impossible to see them achieving a minimum standard of living and at the same time level out emissions at a 1.5 degree temperature. Having said that, the early work of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, always identified two degrees as really the key threshold. And I think that's the one we really have to keep in mind. I think going above two would be a significant problem. And I think all the world's governments do agree that. And that is why the Paris Agreement says well below two. It doesn't actually say two. It says well below two. It's good to aim for 1.5, but I think that if we have pledges that take us to just below two, then that would be an, an absolutely amazing achievement in itself. Thank you. Um, next question. There are so many issues. Yes. Um, let's take, take Richard first, because I'm over at this side of the chair. Thank, thank you. Just um, I, I forget what the, the exact data were in your interesting charts, but uh, China must be one of the biggest total uh, producers of carbon. What, what, could you give us a quick overview of what you think their position is and how cooperative they are in the process? Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah I mean, China is the world's largest emitter um, by a long way now. It was... Oh, there we are. Oh, I've lost it. No, it was there. Sorry. Okay. So China is um, the world's largest emitter by a long way now. Um, in 1990, it had half the emissions of the US, and it now has double, and the US is um, the second largest emitter. But its emissions per person are still significantly lower um, than those of the US. They're around the world average. So we do have to bear that in mind, right? One of the reasons why China is such a high emitter is because it has a high population um, as well. Uh, China is also um, both the world's largest coal extractor, largest investor in coal, and also the largest investor in renewable energies, yeah? which puts it in a slightly interesting and contradictory position. Now, I would say that China is absolutely on board with the need to cut its emissions, uh, partly because it wants to do so on local health grounds and partly because it fits in with its vision of a more modern society that is not based on heavy industry. Um, China surprised everyone last year in declaring that it would cut its emissions um, to net zero by 2060. And it made that declaration unilaterally uh, while President Trump was still in power, so without taking the lead from the US. That was really very significant. Since then, China has also said that it plans to strictly control coal, because coal is still a major source of energy in China. So I think China is trying to do the right thing domestically. It is trying to curb its emissions. And in a sense, when China has a history of under-promising and over-delivering, 
So some people have said, oh, well, China's promised to reach net zero by 2060. That's too late. You know, it has to take an, you know, a stronger commitment earlier. But actually, China is likely to over to overperform on that, I would say. So right now, I am hopeful for China. It, it, it is the largest emitter. But I think the government knows that it needs to decarbonise, and it does want to do that. Um, another problem with China is also its investment overseas in coal. Until recently, it was still investing in countries like uh, Pakistan, uh, in countries like Bosnia. It was still investing in new coal power plants there. But that, I understand, is starting to slow down and indeed stop um, as well. So it's a kind of, it's a bit on a knife edge, but I think China is going in, in the right direction. It might not make strong statements in the international forum because it doesn't like to feel pressured. It doesn't like to feel that it's being told what to do internationally, but I think domestically um, it is going the right way, but there's still a long way to go because it's so huge. Thank you. I think, Susan, you had a question. I'm going to come this way. Thank you. Uh, should we take responsibility for some of China's emissions ourselves? It seems a bit yeah. ridiculous as we import so much from China that we are responsible for those emissions. Well, that, you know what, that is really interesting and that is such an important debate um, in the, especially the academic community. Um, in fact, my husband, who's here, he wrote a couple of journal articles about that, so you might want to discuss it with him, with him later. I think my sense that it's all very well taking responsibility for it, but we have no jurisdiction over China, right? So we can't say to China, I want my goods to be produced using renewable energy. We can't say that because they will turn around and say, well, that's nothing to do with you, it's, it's, it's our country. So I think that's the slight problem with taking responsibility, is that we have no power, we have no control over those emissions. I certainly think we should stop buying so much rubbish. I think that is absolutely true. But whether it comes from China or comes from elsewhere, yeah, we should stop buying so much rubbish. I would say that this issue of um, emissions from overseas, it's actually becoming slightly less significant now because the, the, um, the carbon intensity of production in places like China, so the amount of emissions that are given out in producing goods in China is also going down, yeah, as they improve their, their, their technologies, as they improve their practices. So increasingly, um, an item made in China uh, will have just will have no more emissions associated with it than an item made in the UK, for example. So the problem isn't quite as great. The problem is simply overconsumption rather than where the actual goods come from. If that makes sense. So buy second hand. That is my. That is my tip. Or don't buy at all. <laughs> I think we've got, sadly, we've got just time for one more question. So did I see a, a, a hand over there? Hey, sorry, thanks. Uh, it's quite a big question. Thanks so much for your talk. It was fantastic. Um, the level of detail was so helpful. Um, honestly, I've been around the climate movement for like a decade now, but I'm beginning to ask like whether climate change is definitely the worst problem. Like, I definitely think we should deal with it. But from the data, like honest question, is it worse if we have climate change or if we have like biodiversity collapse or if we have like soil collapse or water collapse? Because it feels like some of the solutions to climate change are also the solutions to biodiversity collapse. But there are also feasible ways that the UN could solve carbon emissions, but like massively destroy other bits of the ecosystem. And like that really freaks me out. Just I have no data, but what is what does the data say on like what our real problem is? Does that make sense as a question? Yeah, I mean basically we are facing an ecological and environmental crisis, and they are all interconnected. You're absolutely right. We are facing a biodiversity collapse, um, sixth extinction, or whatever, and we are facing issues with, with with soil and a whole range of other things too. And these issues are all interconnected. But as a general rule policies and measures you take to alleviate one problem will also alleviate the other, yeah? That there are, some, there are some things where there are conflicts between the issues. There are some, but not very many. Um, I think one problem that we face is that in the UN arena, all these issues are somewhat siloed. 
So there's a biodiversity convention. I could have talked to you about the CBD. Um, I'm not sure there's anything on soils, but um, there's a desertification. Yeah, desertification, exactly. There's a land degradation, desertification convention. Um, there's an endangered species convention. They've all been developed along their own particular processes, and they don't really um, connect very much at all. Um, and that, that, that is a genuine problem. And there are often workshops and debates as to, as, as to what to do about it, and I'm not sure uh, we've got very far. Having said that, um, this brings me to the Sustainable Development Goals, which you'll no doubt be aware, these 17 Sustainable Development Goals that were adopted by the UN um, in 2015, which seek to draw attention to the fact that not only ecological problems, but also human development problems are interconnected as well, right? Because if you destroy an ecosystem, the chances are you're destroying a livelihood for a community as well. But, but, but so much of what we need to do is simply to lower and lighten our footprint on the earth. I mean, that, that's what it really comes down to, whether it's climate change or ozone depletion or species, we simply need to consume less, we need to use less, we need to pollute less. Um, I think that's the key message, and that would address all of these. Of course, it's always easier to say than do, but you're absolutely right to point out that climate change is not just this kind of well-defined issue. It links in with all the others too. Maybe you could ask somebody to come and talk about biodiversity. That would be an interesting one as well. Thank you. So I'm now going to draw this to a close. Um, and I'm going to do two things. I'm going to say a little bit about um, this forum and something about what this church is doing. And then I'm going to uh, try and express uh, on behalf of all of us and those watching online our huge thanks to Joe for the amazing um, amount of information and passion and uh, you know, all the understanding that you have communicated this evening. Very briefly, let me just say a word about um, this initiative. So this is a new um, Christian climate forum. Uh, the issues are relevant to everybody of all faiths, but this is a Christian forum, and uh, we're hoping to continue to all are welcome to have um, a range of lectures and events. And I think the next event is going to be on Saturday, the 20th of November, which I think is a week after uh, the COP conference. We're hoping to gather together a panel of, uh, uh, and you're very welcome to come back and tell us about what's happened. Uh, so we hope and pray for a good outcome to the conference. Um, this church, like many other churches, and it was so encouraging to hear about the percentage of NGO participation that's coming from Christian groups, is on an Arosha eco-church journey. Um, if you're here, do go and have a look at the wonderful displays in the lobby about that and the work that this church is doing to try and set a good example. But above all, I want to thank you, Joe, on behalf of all of us you. for your huge... Um, uh, all the, the huge passion and understanding that you've communicated in an hour or less than an hour you have we could, we could not possibly have read up and understood all the, the frameworks the concepts um, and you've really enlightened us um, but above all we hope that out of your passion we can all try and do something uh, locally in living more sustainably as well as lobbying our MP and others to try and make a difference. So can we express our huge gratitude to Joe De Pledge? Yes, thank you very much to everyone for coming. It was a, a real pleasure. Lots of fun. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to those who helped to organise the evening. See you again soon.